I think we're on. Can you hear us, John? I can hear you well, Leon. Okay, this is good. We're going to get started here. I know there um, we have some audience uh, participation people that are on that are viewing, so we're going to get going and as much as you can. I think it's just your signal might be bad. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Okay, guys, just respond back if you can hear John clearly. I, I get him kind of fading in and out. So um, we're going to start with prayer. Good, mo good morning, everybody. This is All Things Dr. Leo. I'm excited about today's um, interview show. Uh, what have you to share with uh, people that are actually doing the work uh, in music ministry and uh, within the church and otherwise. So today we have John Stoddard as our guest, as a you know, well-renowned musician, this uh, unbelievable uh, guy. And I'm just deeply appreciative of the friendship. Oh, John, I just lost you. I just lost him, guys. Good morning, Gail. We're on this Be Live uh, TV, so we're trying. Here, John's coming back. So let's see, show. Let me hit show. There you are, John. Can you hear me, John? Okay. So, hey, good morning, Mike. How are you? Good morning, everybody. I know we're late. We're just having problems signaling in with this uh, Be Live TV. That uh, format to pull everyone in. So we're trying to get this working here. But anyway, we'll uh, start. I think this is John coming back in. Oh, there you are. You're moving. Oh, okay. Is that a little better? Hey, hey. <laughs> Good deal. Well, let's start with prayer, John, and we'll start. We'll, we'll begin right off. I don't want to take up your time. We know we've been moving like with this. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this day and this opportunity. Thank you for the uh, privilege of ministry and privilege to sharing with your people. Let uh, what we say be an edification to them and glorification for you and for your all for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as I mentioned, good morning. Hey, good morning. <laughs> oh, we got some really, we got some good folks on today, John. So I'm talk about uh, today's All Things Dr. Leo, and I'll share some announcements at the end. But I want to get right to um, today's guest, which I'm so honored and privileged of having uh, and take the time and being available to do this Absolutely. for me. Absolutely. A tremendous musician and gift to the body of Christ and to just the world. And so, uh, John, why don't we just start? You tell us a little bit about your background, your early music studies, mm -hmm. your career, what you're doing now. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, what an honor to be here hanging out with my, uh, my friend, the one and only Dr. Leo Davis. <laughs> Thanks again for having me, my brother. All right. All right. So, um, yeah, so my background is I started playing when I was very, very young, grew up in a musical household, and, um, you know, both mother and father played. Uh, grandmother was a huge influence. She was a church musician as well. She was a Bible worker, community activist. And so I learned a lot about um, playing in church in particular from her, um, just understanding the church services and so on and so forth. So a lot of my understanding of what happens in particular uh, as an accompanist, I learned uh, from her. But uh, my parents were, it was both their second marriage. And so I came into sort of a, uh, what do you call it, blended family situation. So when I was born, I had an older brother and sister. Um, and they were both studying music, uh, piano lessons. And so my dad tells me, he says, when I was about three or four, I would just sit and watch their music lessons. And um, one day I would climb up on the piano after uh, what I did my sister's lesson. And he noticed that I was trying to pick out what it was. Um, can you all see me okay? I'm trying to see myself. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? You did. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I was trying to pick out what I heard on the piano. And um, so they figured I, I might have some kind of musical talent. <laughs> Um, and so from there, I started with neighborhood teachers. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia. There's a great music school there called the Settlement Music School. I started there early in high school and um, went to Blue Mountain Academy for my last two years, where I probably um, was able to start studying pipe organ and had just really great music teachers there. And, um, and then when I got to college, I, I did a degree in piano 
and I did some conducting and voice minor and just as much music as I could get, you know, composition. Um, and uh, also in high school is when I started learning about music production as well. So I was doing that while I was doing uh, the sort of serious classical music as well. And when I got to the D.C. area in 1988, uh, I was attending a church called the Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the pastor there is a guy named Wentley Phipps. I don't know if uh, how many of you may have heard that name before. And I remember he came to my house one day and he said, John, yeah, he's got that big bass voice. He said, uh, you like a carpenter with no tools. Mm. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, man, I have this equipment. I, I thought I was going to be able to make my record if I just had the equipment. But I, apparently I need some musical talent to be able to play the piano and stuff, too. So this equipment's not doing me any good. He said, I'll tell you what, I need to do a new record. If you do the music for my record, you can have all this stuff. It's about $10,000 worth of recording equipment. So that's how I got my first studio and I did my first record as a producer was that was the power of the dream, uh, the power of a dream record, 1993. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and again, concurrently, I was producing a lot of, uh, and writing a lot of, um, uh, independent, uh, working with a lot of independent artists there in the DC area. And so that's a sort of snapshot of my journey. Uh, I did my first solo record in 1997, 98, and it started out as really as a producer songwriter demo, but um, I decided that uh, what, well that I would just go ahead and release it because I've finished all these songs and I said, well, I got to get somebody to demo them. I'll just go ahead and demo them, and that turned into a record and eventually signed with Warner Brothers and did a record with them and uh, have been doing records independently ever since, working as a uh, producer ar uh, arranger. And that's about the time I met Kurt Whalum too, 97, mm. 98, and I started working with him. So we've been working together over 20 years now. Oh, that's awesome. I was just mm -hmm. going to that was my next question. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny, it's a funny story uh, with the Warner Brothers situation. Kurt had left um, Columbia and Warner Brothers was courting him at the same time we had been talking about doing a project. And so the, 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 it was the same, um, what do you call it, uh, A&R guy or, or mm -hmm. VP that was talking to us both. And I guess because it came out in conversation that we were both people of faith, so he introduced us. And wow. Kurt called me at my house one day, man. He had heard that little record that I did in my basement, you know, called Love So Real. And he, uh, there's a song, an arrangement I did of What a Friend We Have in Jesus in Spanish. And mm -hmm. he dug that he's a language guy. So he called yeah. me at my house, man. And said, man, I'm a fan of yours. I said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm a fan of yours. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's how we met, yeah. man. And we've been joined join at the hip ever since. When I see you, uh, you know, when I'm able to experience the performances, you encourage uh -huh. it's just right as joined at the hip. It is like one. Every time yeah. you such in tandem to one another. It's wonderful. So let me yeah. ask you this. Uh, so do okay. you still the church uh and where and what capacity or i i do uh not as much these days as i used to except formally anyway where i used to every sunday i wore every sabbath i was at a church um like i said i played at whitley's church for years and years uh when i was in dc uh i, I did a, a seven or seven or eight years at metropolitan baptist which is right. uh, where dr hicks was the pastor at time at that time and you know richard smallwood uh, is a member there um and and so now, I, I because of my schedule, I don't have a set sort of time that I do it. But uh, I live in Huntsville, Alabama now, and I have an artist in residence position at Oakwood University, which okay. is a Seventh-day Adventist uh, university. They have a big church on campus. So I'm there maybe three or four times a year. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be there this Sabbath with okay. the, uh, the, Aeo the Aeolians are singing. So I'll be there uh, playing for church this what, Sabbath. What, what time is that service? They can stream I know, it. right? right. <laughs> So that, will, that will be 11 central, yeah, like 11 15 or yeah. something like that. Great service, yeah. great music every week, and great yeah. preaching. So, so, so pray for me. I'm in DC now for a concert tonight, and I actually fly in in the morning. My plane lands at 10. Oh, so, you wow. all pray for me. I got to like literally <laughs> run from the airport. It's That's about awesome. 30, yeah. 30 minutes. Um, but yeah, so I, I still do that from time to time. And of course, I, I try to be engaged at my own, my home church, First Seventh-day Adventist as well, when I'm in town. Um, because I still, I think that's just in me. You, I consider myself a liturgical musician, if we can right. call it that. <laughs> so I right. do try to try to stay connected. Because truthfully, Leo, there's I learned so much about 
um, how to understand the moment, um, how mm-hmm. to be an accompanist, how to serve. Um, mm-hmm. I learned in that context, the church context, you know, so um, so that's still a big part of who I am. And you do it so well. I mean, when oh, you're thank in, you, brother. it's just you, it's, you fit right in. It's just yeah. like you, you don't draw attention to it, even though you do, because <laughs> and it's amazing what you add to the service. Wow. But it's just yeah. a blessing. So where do you see church music ministry? Where do you see church music shifting? Do you sense a shift or do you see it? Yeah, you know, then, um, maintain, I guess this double question, then how do we maintain excellence within our with the shift, so how do we still maintain excellence? Yeah. Excellence so let, let me start by um, answering the second question because yeah, I, I, I look back at my experience and there was so much mentoring going on mm-hmm. when I was coming along. Um, you know, I really, well, two things. There was a lot of mentoring going on and there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of, uh, th- there was there. We learned more in the context of um, the actual church service. So you sat and you watched someone do it, and even when you were doing it, you were sort of in a group that was experienced. So you were you were you were brought along in the context of what actually happens. And I think one of the main ways that music in general has changed, not just church music, but music in general. Um, is that a lot of people learn in a context where they're sort of isolated. So if I want to learn how to play the guitar, I can go on YouTube and there's about eight gazillion videos about how to learn how to guitar, right? So I can learn, um, but the problem is, is that I don't have any context for it. So I can learn all the chords, I can learn how to strum, I can learn whatever, but you don't get context until you're in a room with other people. And so I feel like a lot of what happened with this particular generation of musician is that they learned out of context. Mm. And so there's a struggle when they get in the context as to where to use and how to use the skills that they've learned um, so that they uh, they make sense and they work and they enhance, whether it's playing in the jazz band or if it's playing, you know, behind this person or playing in church or wherever. So our job now, I think, is to help give people context um, for all these amazing. Because the, the other thing I think is that they're musicians now. You meet them and they learn. They can play bass and piano yeah. and guitar and they can sing. They're right. so gifted. Mm-hmm. And so our challenge is just learning, giving, um, giving them tools to contextualize these gifts so that they have power and, and impact, you know, um, in whatever context they're using. That's excellent, John. That's 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 it. Mm-hmm. That's- yeah, so many gifts and so they so much. It's yeah. like it's contained and the, don't right, know right. How yeah, to do it. Don't know where to use it. Yeah, and, so and I, I think ment- Yeah, yeah. But so mentoring is a big part of that, Leo. Yeah. You know, I mean, you and I, we we run into great musicians all the time, and I'm always looking for ways because you want to be respectful too. You, know, you don't want to just walk up to someone you just met and say, "Hey, man, you play great, but you need to do this, this, this," or "Hey, young lady, you know, you need to." Do- so a big part of it is is making sure we have relationships with uh, these young musicians, especially. I get old. You see, I got all my gray hair now. But uh, <laughs> trying to be easy. <laughs> so it's important that we maintain relationships and develop relationships with these musicians. And, and it becomes a two-way thing because, you know, I listen to these, 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 these cats, man. I'm like, man, how do you do that? So it's two-way. It's not just me telling you, hey, this is how it should be done. But I'm also learning and and receiving um, from these young guy, uh, young young musicians who are so gifted, man. Yeah, oh. hearing stuff we wouldn't even think man, about. Man, I'm like, where? How did you come up with that? It's just, uh, I think they just have so many resources now. What well, we do. did, uh, they, they have so many. It's like it's social yeah. media, YouTube. Everybody's doing right. something all the time. Yeah. It's all, but it's it's you're right. Again, so much. Yeah. So let me ask you this, John. So what are some of your personal standards of excellence and ex- mm-hmm. And how do you execute those? You yeah. Think? You know, I um, I don't know if I think about it specifically that way, Leo, but I, I would say if I had to, 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 to step back and say, well, what are some of the overarching principles that govern what I do? Um, I, they're really simple, man, particularly in the context of being an accompanist. So if I'm playing for a church service, I'm, I'm supporting. You know, there are times where I'm the, the artist, okay? So I'm there, I'm a performer, 
you know, my name is on the marquee, let's say, for example. So people have come to see me. All right. So th- there, there's a different posture, a little bit of a different posture when you're in that role than when, say, I'm playing this to tomorrow, I'll be playing for this church service mm-hmm. where I'm in what I see as more of a supportive role. Um, so when I'm in a support role, for example, you know, we were just talking about, uh, you know, these gifted young musicians say, oh, man, can you show me how to do that? And they show you something incredible. I say now, that's awesome, but maybe let's not do that while somebody's praying. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so let's right. find where that where that fits, you know. So um, one of the overarching principles I would say is is let's understand what's happening in the moment and be willing to serve that moment um, and let that be sort of the highest uh, or the or the the thing that drives what we decide to do. OK, so I have all these 100 different chords that I can play. But how do I decide which chord I'm going to play right now? And right. a big part of that is understanding what's happening in the moment. So, you know, we talked about somebody praying. So I've got this amazing jazz chord that makes you go, ooh, that's, that's killing. Right. But that might be a distraction while somebody's right. talking. Right. While somebody's talking. All right. So yeah. I have to be willing to to let the moment dictate, you know, what, what's going to happen. So that's an overarching principle. Um, and I, I would say that that maybe is the overarching principle. You know, how do I let the Holy Spirit be in charge of what's mm-hmm. happening in this moment? Because now that I step back and think about it, it's not just as an accompanist, but even when I am a solo artist, I'm mm-hmm. in a band setting, you know, it's really not about me. You know, mm-hmm. even if my name is on the marquee, you know, um, if these gifts are gifts that are given to me and I'm here to serve, that even when I'm a solo artist, I'm serving the people that have come to see. So it's not just about me showing off what I can do. It's about how can I be a blessing to the people who have come mm-hmm. to hear, you know, to hear what, what happened. So. Um, so it, that manifests, maybe a better way of thinking about it is that that manifests itself differently in different settings. But that, I think, is probably the overarching principle, Leo, as I think about it, is that how can I, how, how can I get out of the way in this moment so that God can do what, what God wants to do? And that's whether I'm in a, a, you know, a mainstream environment where I'm playing, you know, if I'm playing with Kirk Whalum, if I'm playing in the church service, you know, it's all designed for God to be able to be a blessing to people in whatever context. So I always have to make sure that I'm trying to maintain that connection so that I can be sensitive to what the spirit is trying to do in that moment. Well, that ties me right into my next question, John. So how Mm -hmm. do you, you you mentioned it so well when you mentioned Kirk, how do you Mm -hmm. successfully navigate between the secular and the sacred? Right. Uh, Yeah, that's that's something that I, I struggled with for a long time because I grew up in a context where, um, you know, I, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist. And so the, the Sabbath is, you know, a time of week that's set aside. And so, like, for example, um, I probably wouldn't turn on the TV on Sabbath, let's say. So I, I say that to say, you know, how I, how I understand that day being a sacred day really impacted me because um, I, I, I felt like I was turning switches off and on. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I'm going to live this way this time or this part of the week, but then I would live this way uh, on this part of the week. And that uh, leaked into what I did as a musician as well. And as I've matured and, and um, come to understand, I think what the Sabbath means for me um, is, is it means something a little different now to where I'm able to say, OK, well, yeah, this time is set apart, but I'm still living one life. Mm. I'm not living two lives. Mm-hmm. And I say that to say, you know, to answer your question, you talk about navigating the sacred and the secular. Um, I, I've. I, and Kirk was a great mentor to me in, in understanding this, is that I'm not secular. Mm-hmm. You know, my whole life is a living sacrifice. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So, um, so how does that impact in a practical way if I'm in what people consider a mainstream or secular environment? Well, first of all, I don't think of it as a secular environment or as a secular offering. How about it that? I might be in a secular environment 
but what I'm seeking to bring is still sacred. Right. And, and, and because I seek to let my, my whole life to, for me to be a living sacrifice. And in many respects, when I'm in a mainstream environment, I feel like I need to be prayed up even more because I'm like, man, I, I'm in a place where, you know, um, there's an opportunity to share my faith or share the gospel in an unconventional way, um, much the same way as a person who's working, let's say, um, let's say you're an architect or you're a banker. So you have ways that you interact with people as a believer Right. Um, even though I'm not in church, right. you know, I'm in a bank. Someone comes into my my uh, my office as a banker, and I get to serve them. I serve them in a different way, I believe, as a believer than I would if I didn't know Jesus. So, yes. um, the excellence with which I serve, you know, I want to be the very best at my job because I represent the King of Kings. So I want to know um, everything there is to know about banking. I want to know everything there is to know about architecture if I'm an architect. So that the person, once they lead that interaction with me, they go like, man, there was something different about that interaction. I mean, they're talented and all, but there was a little something extra. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the same is true uh, of music. When I go out, you know, we, we pray even more when, we, yeah. when we're about to do a concert in a jazz club. Sometimes right. then we do when we're in a church, you know, um, mm-hmm. because we think it's, uh, yeah, I believe it's really important and even more important. You have a unique opportunity in those contexts to share. Mm-hmm. The other thing I think it's important to, uh, for me is that there are some uh, things that I turn down. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I have said, Lord, wherever you tell me to go, I'll go. Um, but there have been times when God, I felt impressed and God said, mm, no, not there mm. or not for that artist or not for. Mm. So, um, so there's a delicate balance again, you know, we live our lives by the moving of the Holy spirit right. and we wait for that voice to say, go or don't go. Um, there, they, Hey, there have been church experiences where God mm. said, mm, not there. So it's not just a secular or sacred thing. I think we begin to live by the spirit and our job. And, you know, you don't always get it right. You know, I, I've, I've taken on situations that I felt really kind of impressed. You shouldn't do it. And I got in the middle of it and I kind of went, OK, God, I, I see why you said maybe not. Maybe not this situation, yeah. you know, <laughs> but no, I think it's. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, go ahead. I, I think it's important to begin to live by the spirit as believers. And so you have overarching principles that guide you. But there are going to come those days where the spirit is going to tell you to do things that, man, you may like, like, you sure, Lord, you want me to, you want me to do that? <laughs> and we have to be willing in those moments to, um, to follow the spirit, you know, even when I, I think you talk about, uh, I, uh, Kirk and I see ourselves as Paul and Silas. I, I say Paul and Timothy because Timothy was younger than uh, Paul. <laughs> so <I teach> Kirk. <laughs> um, but I, I'm imagining, man, what it must have been like for him with his re- with all of his religious training and upbringing. I mean, he was a theologian, yes, was. and for God to sort of wreck his whole religious paradigm and basically start over in many respects. Um, and I think about that uh, in my own experience is that, you know, I, I think there's a place and I haven't thrown the baby out with the bath water in terms of what I've been taught and what I've learned uh, in my upbringing and my faith tradition. I believe it has its place. And I believe that God had me um, come up that way intentionally. Mm-hmm. But I do think like the Apostle Paul, that there comes a time where you have a personal encounter with Jesus and it, it, you have to reframe a lot of the stuff that maybe you were taught growing up and say, okay, well, where does that fit in this context of my calling and my purpose? Um, And so I I like studying the life of Paul. It had to be from a very practical standpoint, man, just a a head trip, man, for him to be like, okay, wait, but I grew up doing this. And the Lord, you know, and you said, no, that's not what it's about. It's about this thing over here. So we have to be willing, um, you know, with great counsel from, you know, people that, you know, you, you and I are brothers, so we hold each other accountable. You know, we have people who will ask you tough questions, say, hey, man, are you doing that just because that's something that you want to do? Or did God really impress you to do that? You know, because we're always wrestling with that flesh person inside of us that just wants to do what we want to do. 
Right. Every day we have to surrender and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do in this moment and be willing to do it even when it's uncomfortable? John, that's, that is just uh, powerful. I'm so glad you shared that. You mm -hmm. and the other person walk that, do that delicate dance so well. Anthony mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a blessing to be able to be yoked together, man. I, I can't imagine having to do it by myself. You know, yeah. I, I say, you know, being able to do it um, with people that are like minded, you know, yeah. um, it just really, really makes a difference. And I have other brothers. Kirk is one that I do mm -hmm. that I work with a lot. But there are, are lots of people that I work with. Another brother of, of ours is uh, Nolan Williams yes. Jr. Yeah. Nolan is a brother of mine. Um, as a matter of fact, he was one of my groomsmen at my wedding. We're dear friends. Wow. And, um, you know, he is another person who I think, uh, you know, I, I just have such admiration for because he's able to, you know, as a minister, go into these mainstream environments. And he's more of the classical side. But it's a similar type of paradigm to where he's always got, OK, this is the purpose, you know. So he's he's always looking for ways to inject um, uh, the calling into what he's doing. He, in other words, it's just it's part of who he is. So he takes it wherever he goes. And so, he does it so well. He right? does it so well as well. Right. Yeah. So yeah. those are just examples. Well. I mean, that's what I, I aspire to do. You know, yeah. uh, my guys at Take Six, those are good friends of mine. Yeah. I mean, they're 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 out here doing what they do, but it's, there's always that undercurrent. Mm -hmm. You know, right. we're always looking for moments um, um, in what we do to be able to inject, you know, the gospel into what we do. So, so where have we failed? Where do you think we failed? And just one more question after this: where, where have we failed in maintaining the standard of musical excellence, or yeah, example within the church or within worship? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you know what I would like to see, um, because, you know, I think there are many instances where there's a lot of exciting new things going on in music in the church. And I'm really excited to see that. Um, but I, I do wish, you know, that we would. Um, I, I do feel like in some respects, the baby has gone out with the bathwater, you know, um, church is so free now. And I think, you know, there may have been um, in generations past a sense of restrictedness. And, you know, I grew up in a faith tradition that was really conservative. So it was it was only high church it was only mm -hmm. pipe organ. You know, there were no drums in the church. So now we have uh, in that same church. When I go back now, there's a drum set and we have, you know, more contemporary styles of music. Um, but I do think we've done that to some degree at the expense of tradition. Um, and I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive. You know, um, I, I, one of the things I love about my church and uh, Oakwood, you know, I'll, I'll be at, at Oakwood on tomorrow is that, um, we'll do praise and worship, you know, where we've got the drums and the praise team, but we are, we'll, we'll do a hymn too. That's it. You know, or we'll have the orchestra as right. well. So I, I think that we have to be a little more intentional about that. You know, it's okay if we have an acoustic instrument, acoustic piano. It doesn't have to be keyboards. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> and all all you know, right, right. So I, I think there's room for I think there's room for both um, because there is some power in the spiritual. There's power um, in a hymn. You know, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And I think there's something about that, those songs that serve a part of our Christian walk um, that's just as necessary as Tasha Cobbs for your glory that's or, it. you know, or, or Ty Tribbett or, or, or Fred Hammond, you, you know. So I think there's a place for all of it. And when you meet those guys, if you were to meet Tasha and you start singing What a Friend We Have in Jesus, she would sing right along with you because she right. knows that song, you know. Um, and so I think we have to be more intentional about including and not throwing out, you know, um, where how this music got here. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing I think is important, Leo, is that not just in church, but we have to help people find their gift. And the reason why I think that's important, especially with kids, is because we have um, we have, be, be, we have, we encourage people in areas where they're not gifted 
because we feel like we, sh- we need to just encourage people. So we have a young person um, who gets up and plays at a recital. And I think music education, for example, is great for all kids. I think we should have some music. I think it's a liberal art. I think it's something that, that people should be exposed to. That's important. But every kid doesn't have the gift to sing right. or play an instrument. And so when someone gets up and sings out of tune, we, not that you should tear them down, but we, don't, we can't encourage that. Right. Um, and that sounds like a cruel thing to say, but I, I don't mean it to be cruel. But what ends up happening is that that person has a gift that they do excel at and that they do do very well. And what happens is, is when we encourage them in something that's not their gift and not their calling, we do that at the expense of the thing that is their gift and is their calling. And whatever that thing is, the body needs. And a lot of people who covet gifts that are up front, you know, music and preaching or talking or whatever it is, um, you know, there may be whatever reasons, there are reasons behind why they want to do that that if we can get to the root of that, minister to that so that they feel comfortable in where their calling really is, um, then I think that the body is edified overall. Now, why is that important? Because I think that's one of the things that happens in music is that we are, we are encouraging people to do things where they're not gifted. Okay. And it's at the expense of the body. So that's the second thing. And uh, the third thing is, is what I said early on. I think this mentoring, bringing along people who do have those gifts, uh, because of the different ways that people are now learning music, we need to work harder at helping them develop context, either um, giving them opportunities where they do get to play. You and I, when we grew up, you didn't just start out playing for divine worship. Right. You started out playing in Sabbath school or Sunday school or for the youth service, you know. So we had opportunities where you got to develop, mm-hmm. um, you know. Uh, so we need to make sure we're providing those opportunities for these young musicians to begin to learn not just to play, but okay, where do where does how does all of this how does all of this fit together, um, so that they can understand, so that by the time they get to situations where they're perhaps ministering in a larger context, they've had some experience, they've had some training um, beyond just the musical training. Because especially in church, it's not just understanding the notes. You, you have to understand the moment. You have to understand the context. You have to, you know, there's, there's more that's going on than just the chords. Right. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So those are kind of my, my, my humble two cents to the conversation. <laughs> uh, this has been so invaluable. We're going to see the results of this as I share it. So I want to thank you for your time, uh, my friend. Absolutely. And I want to just publicly, we're going to invite you to do a session for the musicians and, and people in music ministry in the city of in Memphis. So oh, that's I would be so honored, man. It, let me, tell you, let me tell you something about Memphis, man. I, it seems like every church I go to in Memphis, the band is just like, I'm like, man, where are they, is it, what are y'all putting in the water down there? Oh, my it's goodness, insane. man. I it's mean, insane. the talent is unbelievable. It's really unbelievable, man. I, I have just been um, so impressed by what I see just in general in that city. Um, there is such a legacy of great music history, you know, gospel music, blues, R&B. And so whenever I come to that town, man, so I, I would be honored to come and learn what I can learn. I might throw one or two little cents in there, but I'd be coming to learn, man, see what I can learn. Yeah, yeah, I just appreciate you. John is a great guy. John does a, a, usually, for the last several years, you've been doing the our orchestral, orchestral arrangements. Yes, stuff. yes, yeah. And so yeah, you don't I'm want to... I'm Go gonna ahead. want to come. I want to come one of these years, Leo. You know, that's one of the to... things about being an arranger. You don't always get to hear the final right. product, but I, I have to come one of these years to hear. And, I, and we've got a great orchestra this year, so it's it's a larger orchestra. But anyway, that that leads me into some of my announcements. Uh, don't forget, <laughs> August that our December Christmas concert with Gregory Porter, mm-hmm. Brandy Sutton, Woo! and Napoleon. Wow. Uh, it's going to be a great evening of music. Already the VIP tickets are sold out. So we don't wow. want you to miss. General admission tickets are $25. So we're looking for you. Go online, Eventbrite, 
call the church, get your tickets. They're going to be sold, I know, by October 1st. So right. don't wait. Uh, also, Rome Coral Festival, those of you that are interested, email Festival at gmail.com. So we're excited about that. I'm excited about uh, my new book, book two coming out, No Gimmicks 2.0, September 1st. Uh, John's sister is my partner in crime. Yes, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Bonnie Jones. And so we're working together on this. It's going to be a great compilation. I'm excited about it. And so, again, I thank, I'm just grateful to God for how this is, this show or whatever you want to call it is blossoming and it's excited about next week's guest will be, they've confirmed uh, Dr. Joyce Garrett, the Minister oh, of Music. Oh, yes. yes. And, I I think think so. and, and the Assistant Minister of Music. Mr. Theodore Tharp is going to be with us uh, both at next week. So I've got to figure out how there's a way I can do a talk show with Be Live and everybody's on at the same time. Yeah, so that'd me. be awesome. So, John, would you dismiss us in prayer? Tell us where you're playing tonight and then we'll pray. We'll pray so, tonight you. we are at Bethu uh, Bethesda. Bethesda Blues and Jazz here in Bethesda, Maryland. And um, Kirk Whalen, a very okay. special guest from South, uh, from South Africa, Zahara. So definitely oh. come on out, um, and you can the, the link for the tickets are at kirkwillam.com. Okay. Um, you can get tickets for that. So that's where we'll be tonight, and again, again tomorrow morning at uh, Oakwood uh, University SDA there in Huntsville. So if you uh, hop online, and the Aeolians are always uh, amazing oh, there, and I believe Dr. Bird is, is speaking. So and that's eleven sure. o'clock Central Standard 11, Time. Eleven Central, and I think the concert tonight is at uh, I think it's at seven. But the oh. details, the details are on the site. So well, I'll be tuning in to both. Uh, <laughs> not tonight, but definitely service tomorrow. To tomorrow, yeah. awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, John, awesome. you want to dismiss in prayer? Absolutely. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to share with my friend and uh, the people who have gotten a chance to join us as we just attempted to share um, just a little bit of our story. You know, there's so much that we gain when we share with each other. And um, so it's just been my privilege to share a little bit about uh, the journey that you have me on. And, and God, I don't have it all figured out yet. And, um, and none of us do. And so we're just grateful that you're patient with us all. And our desire is to, to love and to serve you with these gifts and talents that you've given us. So just help us uh, be our guide. Uh, I pray a blessing on, um, on Dr. Leo as he uh, shares with this um, with this ministry here, just sharing information and uh, resources for people who are looking in their different uh, areas of service to be able to improve and um, that this will be a blessing to them as well. And God, we so look forward to when you come back and take us all home, we're going to have a big concert or whatever we're going to call it up there where we're all reunited, the saints of all ages reunited forever and ever. God, um, keep us until that day. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, John, signing All right, off. Brother. Okay. Bye, Take everybody. Care. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye-bye.